Welcome to the Wing Chun Discussion Podcast with your hosts, Dane and Vito, interviewing Wing Chun practitioners and instructors, expanding the world of Wing Chun. Welcome to the Wing Chun Discussion Podcast. I'm Vito. And I'm Dane. And today we have Andy Masterson on from Masterson's Kung Fu in Westville, New Jersey. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, thank you for being here. Yeah, so with our episode today, Andy Masterson is is out of New Jersey. He has his school, masterson'skungfu.com. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about the history of uh, Kung Fu and, and how it relates to Wing Chun. So, so Andy, when uh, I visited your school a few years back, uh, I remember there being a long timeline up on the wall where you, you illustrate the beginning of Kung Fu and when all the styles come in and it's immigration to the United States. Uh, we'd really love to hear a, a bit about the history of where Kung Fu actually comes from and its origins and where Wing Chun comes into the timeline. Okay, well, it would be nice if it were a very clean cut line, but it doesn't happen that way. Uh, China is very, very old. Uh, there's written history only goes back to about uh, the Shang Dynasty period, which started at 1600 BC. <clears throat> there is the, um, the Zhao Dynasty, which is semi mythical, and that is said to go back to about 2000 BC. Um, but they're having trouble finding uh, significant archaeological evidence for that, although they have started excavating further out in the Gobi Desert, and there is a theory that uh, one of the uh, cradles of civilization within China was actually farther out um, towards the west. Uh, time will tell what we find out from that. Uh, so what we have to do is we have to try and separate what's history, what's legend, and what's myth. So according to what we actually know with recorded history only going back to uh, 1600 uh, the first examples uh, or mentions that we hear in China about a martial art is in the spring and autumn annals and it doesn't go into a whole lot of detail martial arts were kind of looked at as um, sort of a way of life um, especially with any military that had to have some training so there are stories of uh shui shao uh Zhao Li, and these were um grappling drills that were said to uh be taught to military troops now according to chinese myth and so you want to keep in mind here like the the, the dates so if recorded history pretty much starts at about 1600 BC. According to Chinese myth, it goes back to the time of the Yellow Emperor or Huangdi, and that was his reign was from 2697 BC to 2598 BC. So he was said to have ruled for 100 years, so of course that would have put him at about 130, 140 years old. <clears throat> so take that, you know, however you'd like. But, uh, he is said to have introduced the concepts of the bow and arrow and martial arts to China some thousand years before uh, a recorded history could verify that. So that's that's an issue. Um, what we do know is that a lot of these early uh, systems, whether it's uh, Zhao Li, which was uh, translates to horn budding, because a lot of the uh, the armor had horns on it, and they would use, much like in modern wrestling where you use head control, where you'll take your head and you'll use it to actually push your opponent's head out of the way to um, get a better position and, and be able to throw him down. So, so how far how far before are we talking uh, when Shaolin Temple started to acquire the arts? Oh, uh, this is probably about, a, um, probably about 1,800 years earlier. Okay. <clears throat> So Shaolin Temple, and I'll, I'll get into where that comes in, into play too. My my main uh, motivation for this was the, the lack of uh, information. And when you start reading, you find that everybody has a matching story. But the reason for that is because everybody goes to the same sources. And when you go to the same source, you're going to get the same story. So... I started to look at things from alternative routes. Um, 
to try and find mentions of things, trying to find like, you know, different examples. Uh, now, in this time period that we're talking about, most of your weapons were made out of things like, you know, bronze or bone and stone. <clears throat> so some of these things might not have been the most reliable weapons. So if you're on a battlefield and all of a sudden your weapon breaks, you had better know how to handle yourself hand to hand or empty hand against a weapon or else you're not going to live very long. And which kind of brings us to the, the idea of what is a traditional martial art. And a traditional martial art, by its definition, is suggesting that that martial art had to have um, stood the test of time. So, in other words, if you lose a fight, no one's coming over to you and say, hey, can you teach me how to lose a fight like that? Uh, you would have to win the fight. You would have to uh, kind of prove yourself. And then people would want to take your advice and train with you. <clears throat> so... Uh, these martial arts were developed during some of the, the most violent periods in human history. And we know that there were grappling techniques back then. We know that there were kicking techniques back then. You see uh, sculptures and paintings. Now, unfortunately, ancient China is not like ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt, they carved things in stone and it lasts forever or a very, very long time. In China, most of the paintings and things were done on silk which, of course, doesn't last for thousands of years. So we're, we're very limited on what we have as far as uh, what we can uh, point to and say there's a, um, uh, a definitive example of something. Uh, for another example of this would be things like acupuncture. <clears throat> now, we know that uh, all throughout Asia, acupuncture has been in pretty much every civilized country in Asia for hundreds of years. Now, in the in tombs in the Shang Dynasty, they found needles that were made out of uh, bone and stone that look an awful lot like acupuncture needles. But because there's no documentation, we can't actually say that they were used for that. They could be used mm -hmm. to, for lancing. They could be used for you know, sewing a number of things. But <clears throat> the the fact is that these these needles that look an awful lot like the acupuncture needles that they use in modern times are there. One yeah, so that we find a lot of evidence, but uh, but the um, the written stuff is is uh, is what we're lacking. Exactly. Yeah. So there's you, know, you have to make a lot of assumptions, and and but we do that all the time anyway. We um, we, we make leaps of faith. Uh, we try to support as much things as much as we can, but there's going to be uh, uh, some level of just taking something on faith. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> these martial arts um, uh, are coming into play um, during this period. And, and China itself is like, there's, when we look at things as far as the, uh, um, the development of the culture, the, the culture uh, started off um, as what China has always called itself. Guangzhou translates to the central kingdom. So it means they, they were the center of everything. People, they, that was like the beginning of civilization. Other tribal places would come along to them and trade with them. <clears throat> but China was like the hub. And so... Along with it, you start to get the philosophical approach with this. Now, this brings us into the I Ching. So the I Ching is one of the oldest texts in human history. It is, um, mythically, it was composed by uh, Fuji. Now, Fuji was one of another mythical character um, who was one of the last survivors of the uh the great flood uh it kind of parallel him and his sister noah were the only survivors and it said that fuji received the trigram from the back of a tortoise uh shell or a dragon horse gave him to him it depends on the, the version you hear now the, the trigrams of course are um 
line patterns that represent the different phases of yin and yang. And from this, it was said that Fuji composed the I Ching. Now, the I Ching was not uh, formalized into a, uh, a book form or a, a, a bound copy until um, about a thousand years later, <clears throat> um, about a thousand BC, during the Zhou dynasty, um, the emperor's brother, uh, the, the Duke of Zhou, he collated it into a, a bound copy. And this became like a central, it, it is still one of the central um, uh, elements of the Tai Chi, of, not Tai Chi, of the Chinese classics. Uh, there were, back in, in ancient times, there were uh, five texts that had to be uh, learned in order for you, you to advance in government positions and things. <clears throat> so, um, which we get into later. But anyway, as far as it pertains to martial arts, this concept of yin and yang started back at least around this period of about uh, 1000 to 1600 BC. Now, uh, the Zhou dynasty is still the longest uh, lasting of all the Chinese empires, lasted about 700 years. And during this time, this is where you see uh, elements of mentions of things like Shui Shao. Now, Shui Shao is not a style. It's, it's a category. It's, it, it's grappling. Okay, so, um, and of course, like, you know, we look at things in terms of, like, four ranges of combat. Uh, Bruce Lee kind of popularized, uh, although he didn't invent it. Uh, there's a kicking range or striking range, a uh, trapping or entangling range, and then a grappling range. And all the Chinese martial arts contained elements of all these ranges. So what you see here is this is the, the basis of Taoism. Okay, these guys were the ones who, uh, they became your physicians. The, um, they were studying things at the I Ching, because it's all the I Ching and the Tao Te Ching are very bound in nature. Uh, so they used a lot of natural cures, homeopathy, <clears throat> like, but most medicines all around the world have some, some basis in natural herbs and things like that. And, and the chemicals that you find naturally occurring. So <clears throat> these guys were incorporating some of this stuff, uh, way back when. Now, as you move through, uh, the Zhou dynasty and the warring states period, um, the, the Chinese were putting lead in their arrowheads. Okay. Now, to give you some perspective, at the same, relatively the same time, the Romans were pumping drinking water through lead pipes. So the Chinese understood it was poison, and the Romans were like, hey, this is a great material, we can shape it and we can pump water through it. Not realizing, of course, that it was poisonous and would make you crazy. Yeah, so a way off. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> so, um, if we move forward a little bit and we get into uh, Lao Tzu. Now, Lao Tzu was an older contemporary of uh, Confucius. And Confucius um, has some, some quotes and statements, of course, which you know we, we have to debate whether or not they were actually attributed to him or whether they were um, added in later. But that's that's a recurring problem we always have. But one of his statements was that uh, we should be practicing uh, literary and uh, artistic arts as well as martial arts in your practice. So there are suggestions that martial arts were much more commonplace. Uh, um, oh. Yeah, so there we know that they existed. Okay, so <clears throat> now our question is that what are we going to assume? Okay, because you're talking about the Chinese people who, um, and full disclosure, I'm not Chinese. I'm, I'm mostly Irish, so I don't have any vested interest in, um, in just applauding Chinese because they're Chinese. Uh, but they created some of the most amazing inventions the world uh, has seen. They were the first ones to make paper. They were the first ones to make gunpowder. The first ones to have uh, movable printing. They made the first compass. Um, mm -hmm. so these, <clears throat> these things were, um, they were very inventive people and they didn't, 
just waste things and throw them away when they were done with them. They would they would uh, reuse things. So, especially if it was effective. So the idea that uh, if they found something that worked, they wouldn't abandon it. Now, and this is one thing that has to be noted about China. Uh, there are some civilizations that are somewhat older. Uh, you have Samaria, Harappa, uh, ancient Egypt. They're older, but the difference is that China has never been completely destroyed like these other civilizations have. China has pretty much, other people have been in charge of it. Other uh, nationalities have been in charge of it, but it was never destroyed. So most of the knowledge, um, except for during the period of the, uh, the separation between the Western Zhao and the Eastern Zhao, Zhao period, <clears throat> where uh, a lot of the information was burned, um, it's been pretty consistent uh, all the way through. So we have records. Uh, yeah. If you're familiar with um, uh, the book, uh, The Art of War by Sun Tzu, um, they were meticulous record keepers. There are a couple of battles that are referred to inside The Art of War. Well, the one battle consists of 12 separate volumes describing in painstaking detail everything that happened during the battle. Wow. So these guys tended to be thorough with a lot of things. Um, unfortunately, martial arts tended to be looked down upon. You were sort of lower class if you if that was your living. Uh, <clears throat> like we see um, traditionally that if your father made shoes, you would end up in a career making shoes. Um, if you didn't have a trade, you would maybe get drafted into the army and maybe become a mercenary because uh, there was always some kind of conflict going on. I wonder if, uh, uh, sorry, I wonder if like martial arts were looked down upon in that way because like if you needed to use them, then you were kind of a lower class. If you didn't need to, uh, right? Like you weren't educated. You, were more, you had, yeah, you had no other alternative. So yeah. it, was, it was sort of base level. Um, so anyway, we get into like uh, Lao Tzu's time, <clears throat> and with the. Uh, that's that's where the Tao Te Ching is said to have come about. Now, <clears throat> it's important to note that uh, we don't actually have, we can't prove that Lao Tzu actually existed. Uh, there is some debate whether or not it was actually uh, all composed by one author or many different authors over a period of time. For brevity's sake, we'll kind of just say that all right, yeah, there's Lao Tzu, and he was the uh, the origin point of the Taoist philosophy at that point. At at a much later date, it does in fact become a religion where people start looking to use Taoism for uh, immortality and, and alchemy and things like that. <clears throat> so um, during this time, you know, this is about 600 BC, 650 BC. Um, about 200 years later, uh, you have the first examples of Dao Yin, which were, think of it as sort of uh, a prototype Qigong. So this was, um, they were using these positions for health, for exercise, almost like a yoga. Um, we don't know, we can't prove that there were fighting applications to them because all we have are some tattered silk remnants that depict these things with some uh, some writing on them, describing them. <clears throat> but at roughly the same time, the first written documentation we have that acupuncture was actually used as a therapy is about 300 BC. So it's not without, not too far out of the realm of possibility that acupuncture and, and of course acupuncture, uh, as if you're not familiar with it, um, works on the idea of meridians and correcting the flow of chi or internal energy, uh, which, of course, this is, and this was one of the things that got me uh, on this subject, was I heard a car commercial, and they were talking about how martial arts started in India, and the concept that uh, an Indian monk came over to China and taught them how to use uh, breathing techniques and uh, tap into internal energy as they were uh, working martial arts. <clears throat> the only problem with that is that the Chinese had been performing something like this about 900 years earlier with Dao Yin. 
Uh, so they already had it in there. And this, this comes into play later because you start to see these things. Uh, <clears throat> there is a, um, there was also uh, references made to um, at about uh, the first century BC, uh, there were these things called the five animal games, which was basically trying to uh, get the country up and moving and exercising again. So <clears throat> uh, we know that there was a concentration on health. There, no, we know that there was. What, uh, what time period is this again? This is this is, comes into uh, so Lao Tzu. This is ancient times. Yes, uh, this and this, people weren't getting enough exercise at this time. Well, you're talking about like the privileged class. So ah, okay. you're, you want, you know, it, it's always the way, isn't it? Like, you know, when you, you achieve something, it's like, you know, back after World War II in America, like your, your measure of success was if your children were fat. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> My parents grew up during the great depression. So, uh, there weren't too many fat people out there. So if you were fat, it meant it was telling everybody, wow, like, look at them. They're really well off. He's really successful. So it's kind of a similar thing. Now, this time period that I'm talking about goes from about 1600 BC to about like 100 BC. And this is this is a kind of a pivotal thing here. Now, <clears throat> Taoism, uh, there are competing philosophies that go along, not necessarily competing with each other, but they're concurrent. So you have uh, you have Confucianism, you have legalism. Uh, you have Taoism. Uh, a little bit later on, you have Moism, uh, which is basically like a meritocracy kind of idea. Um, Confucius was basically, uh, he came along and said, like, look, um, you, mankind is inherently good, okay? And they want to do the right thing, and which replaced or was an alternative to the legalistic concept, which suggested that mankind is inherently evil and without strict uh, guidelines and punishment, risk of punishment, you wouldn't behave yourself. Mm -hmm. um, Confucius comes along and his, his, that's the Romanized version. His name was Kong Fuji. And um, he was uh, kind of reversing this and saying, no, like if you explain to people and you educate them why they have to be, efficient and, and good at their jobs and produce things effectively, <clears throat> once they understand their place, then they'll produce adequately. Uh, Taoism is basically a, an idea of um, it's the glass it isn't half full, it's not half empty, there's two ounces of water in the four ounce glass. Um, and sometimes there'll be more, sometimes there'll be less, but you just kind of, you, you, you bend with it and you adjust with it. So that became uh, a core tenant within Chinese culture. And you could, you could be any kind of combination of the above. You could be a Confucianist with Dallas tendencies. You could be a Dallas with legalistic tendencies. You could, you know, <clears throat> it wasn't like anything where you had to like have, you know, here, pick this one this is what you go by. But what we see is that Taoism was a central part of, Chinese culture. So at about the same time Lao Tzu's coming along, in 563 in Nepal, you have Sakyamuni is born, who will become uh, the Buddha. And so Buddha hits China about 700, or Buddhism hits China about 700 years later, in about around 200 AD. <clears throat> so it comes across the Silk Roads. Uh, now, there is also there is there are three forms of Buddhism at this time, Tantric, Theravadic, and Mahayanic. Now the Mahayana Buddhism <clears throat> blends with native Taoism and becomes what is referred to as Chan Buddhism or Zen as is pronounced in Japanese. Is that uh, similar to the sorry, is that similar to like the modern day Buddhism that we have? Well, again, you still have these other variations of it. You know, it's like you have yeah. you still have Tantric uh, Buddhism, Theravadic Buddhism, and Mahayana Buddhism, and many other you know subsets and so forth. <clears throat> but this is yeah, I didn't even know that. When you look at Zen Buddhism, which is primarily uh, recognized in Japan, this was the model for that. This is like you know, kind of like the uh, uh, 
Very, very, very similar. Uh, there's not a whole lot of information on it. In fact, there's only one book that out there in current publication that I found that details the what Chan Buddhism is, and it's called The Hoofprint of the Ox. Uh, I don't know the author. I don't know exactly when it was published. I had a copy, and I lent it out to somebody, and I haven't seen it since, and I haven't gotten around to buying another copy of it yet. <clears throat> so it's interesting. But um, this is what you see now. So so is this when we see Shaolin Temple come in right around this Shaolin, time? Shaolin Temple is going to come along at either – and there are conflicting uh, dates for this. Okay, some people place uh, the creation of the Shaolin Temple at 425 A.D., and some people place it 50 years later, 475 A.D. I can't find um, a specific source, so I kind of include both of them in my timeline. <clears throat> now, to keep in mind, the first uh, Dallas Temple was built in on Wudan Mountain at 25 AD, so about 400 years earlier. Now, there's there's a fundamental difference here between like the Buddhist teachings and the Taoist teachings. <clears throat> Taoism did not have a a set structure like uh, the monastic structure where, uh, like Buddhism had, where you had acolytes, you had levels of a priesthood basically, and things like that. It was sort of like um, it was much more aesthetic. So if you wanted to become a Taoist, you had to go find a Taoist master and apprentice under him. And it was much more like a one on one kind of thing. Uh, Taoism in itself, kind of the philosophy shuns organization and it shuns uh, the idea of even education to some extent because you're interfering with the natural flow of things. Oh, <laughs> so at, at various points, the two ideologies and uh when Taoism again transforms into a religion and which i have to put in there that there at that time there are still two separate ideas there Taoism is being practiced as a philosophy but in to other people it's being practiced as religion <clears throat> so just because you were a Taoist did not necessarily mean that you were uh looking at it religiously or just philosophically so when so, God, so so d does Wing Chun does it have roots in Taoism or Shaolin? Because I I've heard stories that uh, it could come from either or both. Well, that's the that's the point. So the people who created that the Shaolin Temple were Chan Buddhists. So that means that it incorporated elements of Taoism and the knowledge that the Taoists had of the human body and the Tao Yin. <clears throat> and chi and meridian points and all these things, you know, which kind of goes along with the ideas that like you get from India, which are very similar with the chakras and, <clears throat> and and points like that. So there's a lot of similarity there. So the the Buddhist monks that established the Shaolin Temple were not strictly Buddhist monks; they were Chan Buddhist monks. So therefore, they did have access to this. Um, knowledge of what the Taoist had you know been working on a thousand years earlier so and like we said the chinese don't throw things away if they're working and as case in point you can still go in pretty much any town and find an acupuncturist if you need one in a major center anyway uh, you probably can't find it in nebraska but like <clears throat> um you the east coast the west coast you know you can probably easily find an acupuncturist so it, it shows you how if acupuncture started at minimum 300 B.C. and it's still around and thriving today in the United States, clearly they didn't just toss it out if like, ah, that's old stuff. We're going to do something new. So they, they still perform a lot of it. So the, the Shaolin monks were Chan Buddhist monks. So they did have this knowledge that the Taoists incorporated with them uh, from an earlier time. Now, the Shaolin Temple didn't really gain notoriety for its martial arts skills until the Tang Dynasty was uh, seizing power. Now, the, the Tang Dynasty, uh, they enlisted 13, according to legend, 13 Shaolin warrior monks to aid them in the Battle of Palau. Uh, reportedly that the 13 Shaolin monks... Uh, 
single-handedly defeated 300 of the opposition's warriors and led to great renown within the Shaolin Temple. And this became part of the reason that everybody wanted to be part of the Shaolin Temple because of the notoriety that he gained. And the the emperor uh, sort of like, you know, looked out for them after that. After that, they were allowed to own their own land. They were allowed to uh, keep their own uh, basically military force for their defense. <clears throat> and they didn't have to... And keep in mind, at, at these points, a, a police force is a relatively modern invention. Back then, you know, you're talking about a roving bandit population within China that is about 10,000 people strong. And uh, it was, if you had something nice, it was up to you to defend it. It was, it was your responsibility to protect it. Um, the military would come into mil military was for like winning battles. It wasn't for keeping the peace. <clears throat> so you had like local constabularies and things like that. But for the most part, if like you go and say to somebody, Hey, like somebody stole my ox and somebody would basically say to you, well, why weren't you watching it? You know? So, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of, you know, it was pretty much like you're on your own. And a lot of these guys, because there was so much conflict, most people, most men would spend some time in a military faction of some sort and they would learn how to fight and they would come home and some of these different you know, systems would come along from that. Now, you really don't see this, this idea that we have in like modern times where everything has a specific name. <clears throat> it wasn't like, you know, a style or a school or a, uh, uh, a lineage. It was sort of like, you know, you would have, you know, you would have uh, the Smith style of fighting, the Joneses style of fighting and so forth. <clears throat> so it wasn't really formalized so much in in things but like the techniques and the and the uh, the ranges and things like that were always there. So mm -hmm. it was more localized. Yeah, it was more localized by like the families. Well, you see a lot of the um, uh, the naming of things come along with nationalism, uh, which rises up in the East and um, in the, the late 1800s and early 1900s. So the Shaolin Temple, uh, the Battle of Halal, so uh, you're talking about 600, 625 AD. So in, in this discussion, we've kind of covered an area of about like, you know, uh, 2,000 years so far. Um, <clears throat> and you see how um, uh these things have influenced one another. And there is certainly evidence to suggest that uh, these elements that were incorporated in there probably lasted and probably, and there was always a saying that uh, internal systems lead to external and external systems lead to internal systems. Um, and there wasn't necessarily this big differentiation between them. All of these things probably had some level of crossover to them, like your internal systems had it external qualities to them your external systems had internal qualities to them they probably all had some form of qigong some form of meditation and i would also add in here too that it's it's worth noting that philosophers did not create martial arts martial arts were created by fighters who followed a philosophical doctrine so you don't get anybody coming along out of a college and saying hey you know what i'm going to do i'm going to go and create a fighting system if you've never been in a war, especially since we see how like fighters were looked down as low class. <clears throat> Certainly a college professor is not going to want to dabble in that thing and kind of like get himself soiled with like, you know, you know, being looked at as peers is sort of that he's a low class kind of guy because status was everything back then. Right. <clears throat> so um, you see these, these, this evolution happen. Uh, now, the, there are lots of other martial arts systems and, in play in uh, in China, and there is an old saying that you know they had northern horses and southern boats. So the fighting systems in the north, like if you look at uh, like very far north in China, a lot of the fighting systems had a lot of long range kicking techniques, which is right next door to Korea, and it's not a coincidence that Korea uses a lot of long range kicking techniques. So like, you know, there's a lot more open spaces, like, you know, in the South, you're kind of a little more cramped. So you had to um, use a little bit more close range combat. So interesting. You, this is what you see going on here. Now, <clears throat> China um, is pretty much the, um, the top of the hill. Okay. And 
uh, everybody is always recognized as the central kingdom. They had, you know, the most powerful army. They were, uh, nobody really messed with them. They didn't really have any uh, outside warfare very much, except for the, uh, the regular um, skirmishes with the Mongols. Um, and at different points, there were um, uh, areas where sort of like you have like the Mongol lands and then you have sort of like a, a buffer area, which is sort of like Mongolia light. <clears throat> now, uh, the Mongols were nomadic. Um, they didn't have a written language, um, but they were fierce fighters. And along comes this guy, uh, Temujin or Genghis Khan. And mm -hmm. Genghis Khan just conquers everything. And here's someone who's functionally illiterate, but he is a genius. And, you know, there is no one that can uh, argue his brilliance. Now, and keep in mind, he died relatively young, too, and he conquered more land than any other human being in human history. Uh, he, his empire stretched all the way from pretty much all of Asia, except for the very southern end of, of China, because these were horsemen. They didn't know anything about boats, so they couldn't cross rivers. So this is where you had the northern Song Dynasty, then the, the southern Song Dynasty. So after they conquered the north, Chinese uh, moved their capital down below the Yellow River or the Yangtze River and um, had the southern Song Dynasty. About what year are we talking right now? Uh, about 1100 AD. Um, so you have um, Genghis Khan, and he also... Uh, was conquering uh, Persia at the time. So it went as far as like modern Iran to southern Russia to the eastern edge of China. Uh, so it's a massive, massive amount of area. And so on the way back from Persia, um, Temujin dies and he is, um, uh, he is succeeded by his uh either his son or his grandson, Monkey. <clears throat> and, but the, um, the Mongols didn't recognize a dynastic system. You didn't just hand the stuff off. If you wanted to rule, you had to win it by your own hand. So his son had to go along and reconquer everything that his father already conquered. No way. And had to like pretty much do it over again and then expanded the empire. And then when he died, Kublai Khan took over and, uh, he pretty much had, to, and he's the one who uh, conquered the rest of China. He pretty much said that these guys like, hey, look, you know, if you help me out with some ships, you know, cross these rivers, you know, we'll, I'll remember you when we finish. Now, Genghis Khan, <clears throat> um, Genghis Khan was so successful because he didn't look to change things. If you had a system in place and it worked, all you had to do is recognize that he was in charge and you were good to go. Uh, he would leave you alone. You just had to pay him his his due. There was a city in western China. I forget the name of it at the, at the moment. But uh, he came, you know, they, they're at the door. And he offers them, look, you can either go along with me or I can wipe you out. And they're like, yeah, we got this walled city. You're not getting in here. So he's like, okay, well, if you don't, I'm going to wipe all of you out. I'm going to kill all, all of you. So a couple months later after the siege and they're running out of food inside, then they send a guy out there to surrender. And he said, no, that that's off the table, you know, and he went in and wiped out uh, probably a million people were executed uh, in the conquering of that city. But after that, nobody gave him any static anymore. They just kind of like, all right, well, that's the way you're going to do it. And, and that post um, along with that Kublai Khan, um, what he did was he kind of went, retroactively incorporated themselves into the Yuan dynasty as like part of China. Uh, <clears throat> so they recognize sort of like it's a Chinese rule kind of thing still. So, so how did this affect the, the Shaolin temple and the practice of martial arts and, and all that stuff around that time? Did, did, well, pretty much China life in, in, in most of China went along like it normally did. Um, somebody else was in charge. It's kind of like, you know, here, like, you know, you could have like one party in charge and a different party in charge, but your day-to-day -day stuff pretty much stays the same. <clears throat> so most of China was kind of going along the way it always had. Uh, we don't have a whole lot. And this is the thing. You don't have a whole lot of like, you know, uh, 
points in here where people are really looking at things and saying, hey, look, look at this. Look what happened today. And look what happened like, you know, six weeks later. It was like big events would get remembered. Big events would be, you know, um, memorialized. Okay, so after the fall of the Mongol Empire, uh, you have the the Ming takeover in China. Now, the collapse of the, the Yuan Dynasty left a huge power vacuum. <clears throat> they people have been so used to being subservient to the the Mongol overlords that they pretty much had to learn how to do things on their own again, and nobody really stepped into that power vacuum. Now, the Ming Dynasty pretty much took over economically and was a, a huge uh, financial powerhouse, um, but militarily not so much. Uh, and so um, about 300 years later, you have the Qing Dynasty. <clears throat> now, the Qing were Manchurian, okay, and completely different culture, uh, very different than the Han people, which as the, the Chinese at large recognize themselves as from the Han dynasty. Um, totally different way of things. Like uh, the best example I can give you is uh, imagine if like New England took over the country and demanded that everybody is now a Patriots fan. Uh, so there were a lot of people, a lot of Eagles fans, a lot of Dallas fans that didn't really appreciate that. So they were at, at odds with them. Now, there, the story is that during this time, the Ming Dynasty, the Shaolin Temple was still loyal to the Ming Dynasty, and they were working on a way to train fighters to overthrow the Qing and restore the Ming Dynasty. And this is sort of where you get the beginnings of Wing Chun. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> it's interesting that most of the Wing Chun in the world, uh, some estimates are usually about 90% of the Wing Chun can be traced directly back to Ip Man. Okay, so the lineage and the um, and the uh, the origin stories, and everything go through that route. And um, at about 1649, you have the first opium war. Okay, this is the first time China is really challenged by an outside force and they lose so they settle the conflict with a treaty but and it was basically the uh at the time before this uh it was said that there was more british silver in china than there was in england because they were buying so many chinese exports but china wasn't buying anything else <clears throat> so <clears throat> the um uh the east in india tea company was like hey, look, we're going to start selling uh, opium here and we need these ports in China. Well, in, in China, your foreigners were only allowed in one port and they weren't really allowed off the ships too much. Uh, they had to get in and get out and they weren't allowed to travel through China. Mm. The first opium war uh, opened up all the ports to, uh, to the foreign tradesmen and the second opium war opened up all of China to the um, to the opium uh, industry, and, and the Chinese knew back then that you didn't mess with opium. It was a really bad idea because it was highly addictive, and you know, well, we see in modern times what it does. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. you see this this happened with uh, during the Qing Dynasty. Now there were a couple periods where uh, there were a couple of the emperors, and I'm forgetting them offhand. I should have like brushed up on that a little bit more, um, who got the idea that, you know what, we should modernize like the rest of the world because they weren't using, you know, modern guns and modern military equipment and things. They were still using traditional things, horses, cannons, things like that, and bow and arrow, <clears throat> while the rest of the world started using bullets and armor and artillery. So uh, what happens is you get into uh, – this period where um, the Chinese are kind of like looked down on in their own country, they become like a laughing stock, and you know you see it in the in the old Bruce Lee movie where like you know China is the sick man of Asia, um, and you see this happening now. In 1897, you have, uh, or let me back up a little bit. In 1895, you have the first Sino-Japanese War, the first war between China and Japan that ever happened. <clears throat> now. Uh, 
it ended in a treaty which heavily favored the Chinese, and the Japanese never forgot that, and they, they kind of held a grudge with it. So when it, it comes around again in 1937, they sort of go after it with payback. Um, 1897, you have the Boxer Rebellion. Now, the Boxer Rebellion was basically an idea to, we want to kick all the foreigners out of China. Now, the Qing government couldn't officially sanction this because that would create open warfare. But what would happen is, like, they think it was they secretly funded it. Um, whether or not they were using Wing Chun at this point, it, it's possible. Um, and we can, we'll get into that in a minute. Um, then in 1912, you have the overthrow of the dynastic system uh, where Puyi is, de is deposed and the nationalists take over. And Chiang Kai-shek is, is uh, the leader of the Nationalist Party. <clears throat> so... Um, this is where um, it man becomes you know, part of the Nationalist Party. And this is why he has to get out of probably uh, this is more than likely, um, because if you've lived in one place your whole life, something had to happen for you to pack up and move to Hong Kong. And that was the Communist Revolution. OK, mm -hmm. so <clears throat> a lot of people aren't familiar with uh, what happened when the communists took over. They started cleaning house and. Their preferred method of cleaning was a bullet and uh, political dissidents and uh, and so forth were first on the list and they got they were executed. So then you had um, uh, estimates vary between 40 and 80 million people were killed uh, either by starvation or uh, murder or uh Gulag, whatever you know, you want to call it, like work camp, re-education camp. So, is this where they burn the temples? Pardon? Is this is this where they burn the temples? No, the temple, was, the, the temple was first burned in 1641. Uh, that was when the Qing government first took over. This is where we see the birth of probably the birth of Wing Chun, and that's where you get the story that. Um, Ng Moi was one of the five masters who escaped and taught Yim Wing Chun. So that that was about uh, four hundred or no, not four hundred, uh, three hundred years earlier. <clears throat> so um, that's where, like, we, we kind of see the the origin points according to Wing Chun, um, or at least the sources that we have available to us. Now, I want to lay this this background foundation here just so you see like oh, well why would it man go to uh go to hong kong and you know, keep in mind like you know here he is you know he came from a pretty well-off family he um he was a policeman so he had a nice steady job he had a wife and kids um you'll never really know this is this is part of the legendary thing you'll never really know how good or bad it man was because now he's entered into mythical territory <clears throat> so people that support it man is going to say he was you know pretty much like you know unstoppable and people that are detractors are going to say no he's overrated he was just popular because of bruce lee um and there's there's some there's some truth to that okay so anyway uh if you follow the story uh the origin story that most of us are familiar with that uh ing moi uh teaches she's taken in by the farmer and in gratitude teaches um, his daughter this fighting system of Wing Chun, or whether it was because of her name or whether it was because of the hall in the Shaolin Temple, uh, the Forever Springtime Hall, that's up for debate. You know, I, I don't think at this point you're ever really going to find out an accurate uh, version of it. Now, in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, there is a fellow named Benny Meng who was really looking into the history of Wing Chun. And he set up the Wing Chun Museum. I believe it's in Cincinnati. <clears throat> but he started really digging into things. And he started talking about um, with people that had other lineages of Wing Chun. And they have different origin stories. Uh, now, the one thing that I found of note was that why, if you were trying to sell your martial art to people, and you were trying to make them believe in its effectiveness. Wouldn't you uh, say that it was it was based around some really powerful hero? Why did you base your story around these two 
Chinese women who have no physical strength really to use. So that's what leads me to believe that uh, Wing Chun in its inception had a much more internal component to it than just uh, more of a, a physical kind of um, a combative approach. Okay, because obviously you cannot use physical strength if you don't possess it. And these two small Chinese women did not have physical strength to use. So it kind so, of says in modern so Wing Chun, I'm sorry, go ahead. So, uh, but but that, that's a really interesting point because so, like, it's what you're saying is um, we don't know like what the true events were, um, you know, based on any evidence of like the origin of Wing Chun. But the mythos behind it, at least the story that we know, is, I guess, sufficient to say that we can know that it wasn't about really physical strength, about overwhelming your opponent. It was more about this other way. Exactly. So now there are two are two ways you can be strong. You can be either be physically strong or you can use these internal concepts, which by most accounts are, are misconstrued as well. So um, but what you want to see is like you can't get around that that fundamental point that like so. And a lot of times you'll see guys that, you know, Wing Chun guys will get in a tight spot. And what do you do? You muscle your way out of it. OK, so clearly that's that's violating a core tenant if that's your go to that you have to do <clears throat> now. Um, what it really comes down to is the, uh, the proliferation of Wing Chun happened because of Bruce Lee. Now, a lot of people don't realize like the impact that Bruce Lee had. Uh, there's a book that was published in 86 uh, called Martial Arts History and Traditions by John Corcoran and Emil Farkas. And somewhere in this massive uh, encyclopedia, it, it says in there that there were about 150 karate schools in 1970 in the United States. That was pretty much it for martial arts schools. And about a year after uh, Bruce Lee died and Enter the Dragon was released, there were 1.5 million martial arts schools in the United States. And now, and that was just here. Um, and the reason I alluded to uh, the Opium War and uh, the Boxer Rebellion, <clears throat> Bruce Lee really came along and he restored a lot of pride to the Chinese people. So he became a cultural hero. Um, and it, it, it's sort of like, you know, when we were here and the Eagles finally won a Super Bowl, like, you know, that was that was a big deal up here. So, you know, it was, it was kind of like the same thing. So everybody wants to be Bruce Lee. Well, Bruce Lee trained with it, man. It man died in 72. So anybody that could prove they trained under it, man, had like a golden lottery ticket. You know, you had people lining up here. Please take my money and teach me this. So. That was a um, that was a, a big thing, and this is one of the reasons that you get like most Wing Chun people, at least the ones I've been exposed to, hate each other's guts. They they have all this infighting. It's like you know my style is, is the real one, your style's fake. I'm better than you. Yeah. <clears throat> Nobody's really looking for, um, and it has to do with money because like you know you're if I can get more students, then hey, I'm better off. And like and uh, really, I mean it's um, and. But honestly, it depends on like the uh, uh, it, it, ha it comes down to the relationship between the teacher and the student. Like I could be a really good teacher, but if I don't, my personality doesn't mesh with yours. You're probably not going to like get a lot out of the class. OK, if maybe I'm a little too laid back and somebody else wants to be a little more hardcore, maybe I'm not the teacher for them. It doesn't mean you should turn your back on the style. And but and this is what you have to do is you have to really question my belief anyway. You have to question, like, understand your art, really understand what the underpinnings of it are if you're going to make it work. You can't just mimic what everybody else is doing and expect that to come out. It's like, <clears throat> I don't care if, um, you know, Bruce Lee or Ip Man or Moyat or, you know, they're not going to come back from the grave and fight alongside me if I get jumped one night. Okay, so. I need for it to make sense to me. I need it for, uh, I need to be able to understand and be able to replicate it. So, and that's, that's my main motivation with things is to really get people to understand the background and history and like really try and dig in to find out and what makes things work. And this leads me back to the idea of where does this posture thing that was so fundamental and so prevalent within the internal systems that were and that have their Taoist origin. And if you apply that to Wing Chun, 
it's it starts to resemble what it's told that it's supposed to be, you know, effortless fighting, like, you know, the glass hand and somebody touches you and like, you know, you have uh, with very little force, like you are able to offset and, and defeat them. So when you add these elements to it and you start to incorporate it in the techniques <clears throat> and you're actively working on not using physical strength, I believe that that is more in line with what Wing Chun was supposed to be rather than like, you know, what we currently see most people using. That's like this traditional, um, these postures of, of the way that it's uh, supposed to tie in internally um, the, with the structure of uh, you know, doing as a person doing Wing Chun versus what's popular right now. Is that is that kind of what you're saying? Yes. I, I think, you know, you see a lot of the, the Wing Chun guys, despite the fact that like, you know, they their schools hate each other's guts. They pretty much do the same thing anyway. Uh, now, my teacher, um, he had first started training um, under Moy Yat in the 80s and then he um he separated from him and then he went in and started learning the uh william chung lineage of wing chun which incorporates footwork and a little more mobility and things <clears throat> and one of the things he said was that um the in his uh estimation the the moyat school tended to be better uh, at chi sao with more sensitivity uh where the william chung school things focused more on sparring and were more effective at combat. Now, of course, that all depends on like, you know, your it, styles don't fight, people fight. So, you know, if, if you get somebody who's, you know, um, it, and a lot of people, you know, they see Wing Chun and it's like, oh, wow, well, that appeals to me. Why? Well, there's not a lot of moving around and things like that. There's, I don't have to like, you know, you know, get myself in this great cardio shape and like, you know, do all these kicking techniques and, and marching, drilling up and down and like really beating the crap out of myself. So it kind of appeals to a lot of people that don't necessarily like that idea of really pushing themselves sometimes. Um, I mean, if let's face facts like it, but every martial art, <clears throat> uh, my point is that most every martial art, every martial arts student, the, the vast majority of people will not really be any good at fighting. Um, because you really have to drive yourself. Uh, and there's a lot of people that like will you know, downplay things like, you know, and, and this has to do a lot with like, you know, the current theme of MMA and uh, um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and so forth. <clears throat> now, um, I came up during a time when, you know, guys like, you know, uh, professional wrestling uh, was, was a, a real thing. Guys like, there's a story of uh, Bruno San Martino, and I believe it was there's another wrestler. It might have been Gorilla Monsoon, and they were they got into this fight in the New York Jets uh, locker room, and they beat the crap out of uh, half the football team. So uh, it was um, uh, a big deal, um, and. They were legit fighters. They were really powerful guys. So uh, you got you got guys like Gene LaBelle. Okay, Gene LaBelle has been Gene LaBelle is a guy who taught Bruce Lee, introduced him to grappling ideas. Uh, he's been um, you know everybody in the world respects Gene LaBelle. Whether you're a Gracie Jiu Jitsu practitioner or you know um, uh, catch wrestling, like if you if you watch like Boz Rutten and and some of the stuff that he does. <clears throat> you know, it's it's not. I've seen Buff Rutten. I I like his stuff. Yeah, he's he's a very scrappy guy. He does you know traditional catch wrestling. Um, catch wrestling was the um the foundation of like modern you know modern wrestling and things like that you see on WWF. Like it was it's a brutal brutal form of combat. Um, you're, can I can I can I ask you something just on this uh, on this um since we're talking about somebody that that I know that we both have know and have seen. When I watch Bas Rutten do his uh, matches, I see, I think I see some of the, some of the principles of, of Wing Chun, which are like the point A to point B stuff, the very like simple stuff. When I see him, I, he does like this liver punch and he like sets it up and it, it all looks really, um, what's the word? Like, efficient. Efficient. Yeah. Simple, but I mean, not yeah. easy, but simple. Right? right. What do you think about that? Uh, I think that there is a lot of similarity in if you were to look at like old time European pugilistic boxing that like you see the uh, 
the logo for the uh, Notre Dame, the little Irish leprechaun, you know, with yeah. the, you know, the arms up in the old fashioned <clears throat> structurally, it's a very powerful position. And therefore, every strike that comes through there is a, now a spiraling and corkscrew strike uh, instead of just a muscular attack. Right. Uh, so everybody kind of had a lot of this shared knowledge uh, about small movements and things like that. Like, and, and so, yeah, I, I definitely think that um, you know, I'm, I don't know exactly what his background is. Um, I've read uh, one, a couple of very small articles on him and watched a couple of interviews with him. <clears throat> and he was pretty much the kind of guy who like he would pick something up and if, if it appealed to him, he would, he would incorporate it. He would use it. So mm -hmm. that was a, uh, um, that was, that's an important element to that. And I think that that idea of efficiency of movement and so forth is like, you know, and, but of course, like, you know, you have to, you have to count on like the fan worship. Okay. So, you'll still have people like, you know, trying to compare like who was a better fighter, Muhammad Ali or um, uh, Joe mm -hmm. Lewis back in like in two totally separate time periods and so forth. It's like, you know, who would have won the fight? Like, well, we'll never know that. And yeah, you, know, you look at things like, you know, where, you know, you have a, a fighter. You know, this is where the professional fighter has the, the big advantage, right? Because like your, your bouts are scheduled, you know, you know when you're going to be able to, when you have to fight. Okay. <clears throat> to this, to the guy who's just trying to survive, you don't have that luxury. Okay. So, and there's no such thing as a random attack, right? Because, you know, people just don't walk to some like a you know, random guy and say, Hey, I'm going to attack you. Keep in mind, you've been selected that day. This is your lucky day. You, you won. Um, I picked you who I'm going to attack. And it's because like, you know, maybe, you know, your your kids were up late and like your 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 son's teething and you didn't get much sleep or maybe you're fighting off the flu or like you just, you know, you feel like crap or you hurt your back and you're walking with a limp. There's a predator out there who has decided today I'm going to attack you. OK, so you're not going into any fight on on your best day. So you really kind of have to prepare yourself to be able to fight on on close to your worst day. Um which is why I like, you know, ideas of things like, uh, like the concepts within Wing Chun or, you know, Tai Chi, even though it's like, it's very, very difficult to use really. Um, but you see people and they take this and it's, a, and it's the same effect that you have with Tai Chi with people. It's, they, uh, it appeals to a different sort of guy. Like, you know, um, it really, I got into doing, um, when I, when I first started, uh, training and I was doing Wing Chun, it wasn't like a pure Wing Chun. It was, you know, Ron mixed it in with like, you know, you had high kicks in there, you had grappling movement. We were doing like, you know, ground fighting from the animal techniques back in 1985. And, um, you know, most schools at the time around here were Korean based um, and they focused on a lot of high kicking techniques. And, and you get people that are like the, um, a lot of the, the grappling guys will like, you know, will downplay um, kickers and punchers and things like that. Yeah, you know, all I got to do is get in and get you to the ground. Well, uh, one of the guys we used to train with, because um, uh, my brother was a, um, uh, he was, uh, he first started in Taekwondo and then did Tang Soo Do, then went to American Goju and then Nisi Goju and then Aikido. Um, he had been a very good wrestler in high school and he kept up on, on studying all that. Uh, he was working out with, um, uh, some guys were showing him old fashioned catch wrestling and we would, we would train together and we had a group of friends from different schools and we would get together and <clears throat> a big wide range. And the one fellow, Tony Talameo, he was, um, his kid had lightning fast feet, like, you know, and anybody who would like sit there and bad mouth kicking, like it's, it's unrealistic and off balance. This guy could get his foot up to your face before you could get your hand up to defend it. Yeah, that's scary. Well, yeah, and you know, you get kicked in the head, and you can have all the sensitivity training in the world, like you know, but if you're unconscious on the ground, it doesn't help you. So you have to, you know, you have to look at things, and and I think that's where you know some of the problem uh, lies is that if you're not training to defend against some of these things, and if you're fighting other Wing Chun guys, then nobody's throwing a high kick at your head. Uh, is anybody really trying to? to shoot on you and, and, and try and you know, get you in a single leg or double leg takedown. 
Um, <clears throat> and you want to see that, you know, it's, it's an important, it's your training, not just the, the, the curriculum for your next yeah. slash or belt level that you have to focus on. So I'd like to ask you this question. Uh, since we're talking about principles and, and talking about, um, you know, different things that, you know, one should be cognizant of, you know, learning martial arts. Um, and we're going to be we're going to be wrapping up soon. But I really want to know maybe one or two or three uh, principles that that you like to focus on in your school, uh, okay. in your approach to teaching. OK, the main thing that I focus on first is uh, is the body. OK, my one of my main uh, points is that we're not using the body correctly. Um, the with all the, the sitting that everyone does and um, the prioritization and the, the bad habits, the complacent adaptations we've created in our movements, <clears throat> most people don't use the posterior chain. Uh, most of the punching you see comes from directly from the shoulder or the chest and, you know, maybe a little of the tricep. Um, the, you know, kicks are primarily driven by the quadriceps and so forth. And now you have things like the glute muscles, which are the largest muscle group in the human body. And they're not there just to hold your pants up. They're there to move you and they're there to be powerful and to support you. And most people don't have the ability to turn these muscles on because the neural pathway has deteriorated to such an extent uh, because of lack of use. Uh, imagine like you know, if you know, it's been you know, 10 years since you had a catch with somebody and somebody tosses a softball to you, you know, you maybe have like a 60% chance you're going to catch the ball instead of like, you know, the 90% chance you would have had back in the day when you were actively practicing. So I, the first thing that I work on is teaching people to get the rest of their body in play. Uh, things like, you know, the, uh, if you take the traditional horse stance that most people get into, uh, you leave somebody standing there in five minutes or complaining how much their quads hurt and their, their shoulders are getting tired. Their deltoids are getting tired. So instead put them in there and have them actively flex their glute muscles and their back muscles, squeezing their elbows back towards each other. And now it's a totally different exercise form. And what you're doing is you're teaching those muscle groups to fire. You're, you're creating and building that neural pathway so that when your body needs them, it can grab a hold of the back muscles to deliver a much more powerful punch than the smaller deltoid will. So that's one of the things we focus on. The other is, is understanding leverage and, and how to properly uh, use the body to generate more force than, than you're going to be capable of, of just in a muscular fashion. And that has to do with a lot of internal principles with corkscrewing, spiraling, and like positioning. And like, and I mean, what is the human body after all, except a, uh, it's, it's a structure that maximizes leverage. So, but how many of us are actually using that? How many, how many of us are using the joints efficiently? You know, how many of us are, you know, we're only using half of a joint. And, and you start to see some of that uh, when you, when you show people the, the difference that can happen, it, it's a very eye-opening experience. Can we incorporate that into our Wing Chun practice? Absolutely. In fact, I, I believe it was uh, <clears throat> um, originally part of it. Um, and I, I do this all the time with people. Like, you know, now I focus primarily on, on Tai Chi here. I have a few people that practice Wing Chun with me. Um, but that's, it's more, has more to do with tone and theme rather than like, um, uh, a, a preference, uh, per se. But <clears throat> when you show people and I get people in here all the time who have trained in other styles and things and, and work in like, and they're like, well, we used to do it like this. And like, all right, well, does that work? I'm like, no. Like, you know, for example, like a Fuk Sao, okay, and a Hun Sao, where you try to roll an opponent's arm out of the way. Try to do that with anybody and see if it really works with somebody giving you resistance. Because remember, in a fight, no one is going to willingly just go along and let you lock their arm up or move their arm out of the way so you can punch them. They have a vested interest in preventing you from doing that. So you're going to get resistance. However, when you add in the circular spiraling nature and the yielding aspect that comes with these internal arts, all of a sudden it works much more effectively. So instead of just trying to like, you know, you have your, your right arm against somebody's left arm and you're trying to roll it out of the way. Well, instead of trying to go to the right, turn left first, then turn right and make your circle and see how easily the arm moves out of the way. And these are all of your internal principles that, that uh, come from the Taoist base, which I believe uh, was 
much more fundamentally incorporated in the Shetland arts and uh, everything else in general. Yeah. You can find the DNA print in pretty much every martial art that's out there now. I was just thinking that because because what you just said, like with that push pull, like I've experienced that with learning Tai Chi. In the same thing, like you, it's a it's a push so that they can resist, so you can pull, or you know, it's a small circle to make them do something, and you can push them the other way. Right. Well, this is this is part of our problem now because we're you know we're living in the world of like you know Joe Rogan and and these guys like you know refer to this stuff as like the bullshit martial arts, <clears throat> and when you see a lot of guys fail like this, like it's it's hard to argue that uh, no, it's it's not like that. And then you get people like they make excuses. Well, you know, in a real, you know, I have to go easy on you because it would be too deadly. And like that, that's a bunch of crap. It's like you know, you're making excuses. So what you have to do is realistically gauge yourself and say, all right, what are the limitations of the way that I'm using this? And am I using it correctly? That's the big issue is like is to find out whether or not you're actually doing it right. And so <clears throat> um, to do that, you need to uh, like things like we're talking about here with uh grappling arts okay if you look at things like wing chun and uh push hands it is to teach you to feel where energy is coming from right so feeling directions of energy mm -hmm. basic wrestling does that all the time that's why when you get the two guys locking up they're pushing and pulling at each other to see if i get you to push back at me and then all of a sudden i empty that and throw you down to the ground that is sensitivity training. It's the same thing. You're just trying to do it at a different level. Now, I think part of the problem is with that um, most Tai Chi practitioners and a lot of and most Wing Chun practitioners is that they are doing this within a vacuum. They aren't necessarily familiar with um, the the ideas of how to grapple and how to throw people and things like that. And one of the things that I do with like, well, the younger students that are in this, I say, look, you're going to learn how to kick. You're going to learn how to punch. You're going to learn how to throw. You're going to learn how to break fall. You might never use these things, but the fact that you've learned them will help you understand the nature of the attack. So in other words, if, if you've never thrown a kick, <clears throat> you don't necessarily know the vulnerabilities inside of a kick. You don't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. And you get these guys and they, they sit there and they, they work on just these, these low line kicks and things like that. And which are powerful. I mean, if you've ever you know, taken a nice you know, Muay Thai roundhouse kick to the thigh, it's a wake up call all of a sudden, like, wow, I didn't expect it to hurt that bad. And, you know, all of a sudden you got a chally horse. So you have to be able to um, experience these things and, and understand them so you can better defend against them. So in your approach, in your approach to teaching, you you try to cover all of these things so that like your students will get a more holistic um, experience with uh, with regards to their to their martial arts and preparedness. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, I think if, you know, uh, if you leave your, your back door open, chances are somebody is going to walk in your back door. <clears throat> Many years ago, I went to a, um, uh, uh, a seminar with a very well-known, renowned Wing Chun grandmaster. And someone asked him, uh, how would Wing Chun deal with an attack from behind? And he goes on to say the story of, one time there was great warrior and one night someone come in and stab him while he sleep. Sometimes there's nothing you can do. Now, to me, that was very, very disappointing because in my school, we had practiced a lot of like grabs from behind and like in how to escape and how to recover and things like that. And here's this guy who's supposed to be like, you know, this like legendary grandmaster. And all of a sudden he's like, you don't know how to defend yourself if somebody grabs you from behind. That's kind of basic. That's kind of like, you know, you should expect that. You should expect the dirty tricks. You should expect that somebody's going to fight in a way that you're not used to. So when you present a glaring opening that you don't know how to defend against, that's where I would attack. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it's very important that, like, you cover all the bases with people. Even if they're not going to become really proficient at it, at least they know how to do it. They've experienced somewhat. <clears throat> and they know if they they touch it in a certain way, it will off balance their opponent. It will give them an opportunity to, you know, to, for lack of a better word, and brevity, like to grab the leg into a takedown. So you've got, uh, yeah. So you've got like um, 
this idea about the, the posture using these muscles that uh, that we don't normally use to make sure that we get the to maximize our body's use also to use it as a as a fulcrum in, in ways uh, you know to use it efficiently and then at the same time you're teaching your your students um, holistically with punch and kick and grappling uh, breaking fall um, to make sure that that they're prepared yeah uh, anything that like that you've um, that you've ever seen in a fight uh, you want to make sure that like your people are aware that these things can happen, you know, that you can, you know, um, there, there are things that are going to, that are going to happen to you that are, you know, somebody's going to try and sucker punch you. Somebody's going to try and sweep your legs out from underneath you. Somebody's going to try and like grab you from behind. Somebody's going to try and put you in a chokehold. <clears throat> and again, and this is another aspect too, that you have to make sure people are aware about, um, because like, you know, back when I first started training, like, you know, you, it was very difficult to, um, to learn some techniques badly, um, cause you actually had to be in a school, not that there weren't bad teachers out there that, you know, taught junk, but nowadays you can get, you can turn on YouTube and pull up how to perform a rear naked choke, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean somebody knows how to do it. And you want to be aware that if you, if you do it wrong, you could kill somebody. And so I say to people like when, especially younger guys that come in <clears throat> and they say, Hey, uh, you have a friend that comes up to you and says, uh, I just learned this, this move in jujitsu class. Let me show it to you. Let me put it on you. You treat that exactly as if someone has this gun in their hand and say, Hey, look, I'm going to put this gun in your head and pull the trigger, but I promise it's not loaded. Like you don't take that chance. It's like, it's, you know, um, too many accidents can happen. I mean, you know, you, if somebody collapses your hyoid process in your throat, you could very easily um, suffocate. And you clearly don't want that just because somebody didn't know what they were doing, but they thought they did. I definitely agree. I agree with that because, I don't know, personally, I feel as I get older, I, I'm more uh, conscious about the fact that I can get injured pretty you know yeah. with fair amount of ease and then that puts me out of either work or, or kung fu practice well you know we have um, uh we have a, a very big restaurant down here um it's been around for about 30 years or so well the original owner uh his wife owns it now a uh, fight broke out out behind the place and he went to break it up and somebody knocked him down he fell down hit his head in the curb and died mm -hmm. so you know things like that can happen things like that can like you know and you want to you know um for i i've done uh, a fair bit of grappling uh in in my combat training and things like that and it's very very effective <clears throat> one of my guys um uh he worked for the philadelphia warrant unit where they had to go get the bad guys um and so they uh they go in to this address where they they know this guy's hanging out and he's walking through the floor, uh, walked through this building uh, with their unit. And he said, it sounded like you were in a movie theater where somebody just spilled popcorn. And he looked down and here were all these used needles. If you fall mm -hmm. down on that, you know, these are shared needles that like, you know, you don't know if these people have AIDS, hepatitis, whatever. I mean, you know, God help you. I mean, this is like, it's a very dangerous thing. It's like, you know, to be now, that's not to, to say that like, you know, that, you know, jujitsu, that's the only option that you have is to take somebody down to the ground. That's not the case at all. And if you've ever had the opportunity to train with a jujitsu fighter, you, you pick up pretty quickly that they're not just a one trick show that they, they can do more than just like, you know, take you down into a guard or a mount position and, and you know, choke you out. It, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, but I want to have my options there about like, you know, can I just, shift somebody around, turn them, push them, and maybe I can get away. You know, maybe it's my age and, you know, uh, you know, at, at 52 years old, I'm, I'm not looking for glory. And like, and, you know, um, one time, uh, when I was working as a, um, in a grocery store as a manager, uh, we had a guy shoplifting and he uh, caught him and he took off out the front door and I'm chasing him across the parking lot. And he, trips as he looked back in to see where I am. And so I grab a hold of a guy's collar and I just say, you know, give me my stuff back and don't come back in the store because I really didn't want to get tied up with uh, another day in court because it just took too long. Right. 
So I come back in and uh, one of the local kids that worked for me said, like, man, you didn't hit that guy, did you? I was like, no, why? He's like, good thing, man. He's the biggest IV drug user in town. You would have caught something. Yeah. And you think of how many opportunities there are for, you know, blood to blood contact. Uh, if you hit somebody and they're bleeding on you, you know, you might not want that. You you might not want to be rolling around in the ground where there could be broken glass and or needles or uh, or. Andy, that, that makes me think um, a lot of people think of Wing Chun as just a striking art. And um, I, I, I think of it more as a. Uh, full range where where there's you know the, the grappling and the we can push and pull and the, the striking is just one very small aspect of it um do, do you I agree, agree and or disagree i agree completely uh in fact one of the things i do is i, I break apart uh the forms um your three forms and, and show you all of the locking techniques that are inherent inside of it uh one of the things that we learn in tai chi is that um uh, what we refer to as naturally occurring chin eye. Um, so it's not necessarily a move that you have to rehearse, but you learn to recognize when the positions are there. And, you know, there's, there's hammer locks and there's, you know, there's choking techniques and there's, there, you know, there's arm bars and there's you know, joint locks and, and wrist locks throughout the entirety of all of your forms if you know how to recognize them. And it's one of the reasons I, I think it's very important to, to introduce people into locking techniques and, and familiarize yourself with you know, different ways that you can joint lock the body. Yeah, definitely. So um, I guess we should wrap up now. Uh, we've, we've covered a lot of stuff. We covered a lot of the history. We've covered the, the principles of, uh, you know, that, that you uh, adhere to for your students. A lot of really interesting stuff. Yeah, um, I, I found that, um, you know, you you have to steer your car. It's like life. You know, you can't be you can't wait for somebody else to tell you what to do and when to move and things. You have to accept the responsibility yourself and you have to take charge of your own training. And if something doesn't make sense to you, like I, I used to I still say to people like my teacher was very, very gifted. He could pick up on things. You could show him something one or two times and he would be able to repeat it. I never had that handicap because it took me the longest time to get any good at anything. So I was always looking for other resources to find how I could make myself better with it and go through that process. Like, even if you think, you know, something like, don't just take it for that. Ask like, you know, my, my teacher had um, the greatest uh, thing that he gave to his students was that he never stopped learning. He was never, he never got himself so full of himself that he wasn't willing to um, uh, accept instructions. He went to he sold his school and went out to uh, Michigan to go into a Bible college to learn how to do missionary work. <clears throat> so while he was out there uh, to make a little side money, he started teaching Wing Chun at this very eclectic karate school. And at the time, they were teaching judo lessons there. So he was like, hey, I want to I've always wanted to do that. Now, here's a guy who just closed down a school that he'd been operating for 10 years with over 200 students. He gets out there on the floor in the mat with a white belt and a gi with everybody else. I don't know a whole lot of um, established martial artists that would have the humility to do that. Uh, and that was his, one of his great examples to us was like, never, never think that you know it all and don't be afraid to, to learn what somebody has to offer. Yeah, that's. That's the type of humility that that is needed when it comes to something that's martial arts is always learning, right? Yeah. You don't know everything. Yeah. Wasn't that Bruce Lee's lesson? Yeah, but you know, Bruce Lee didn't come up with it. Bruce Lee kind of uh, he he absconded with a lot of people's uh, philosophical quotes. Um, and back then, it was it was commonplace for you know uh, a lot of these guys to to trade information. Um, uh, since I started training with Master Ting, I. I have gotten an opportunity to to see uh, what things were like back in China um, in those days where, you know, things were there was it wasn't necessarily like what you see in the movies with all the hatred and rivalry. Uh, there was a, actually a lot of you know, cooperative uh, uh, participation with each other and people that actually loved the martial art and loved doing things. It was um, uh they were always looking to better themselves. They respected other people that were looking to better themselves as well. 
Cool. So Andy, thank you so much for, you know, for, for coming and speaking with us today. Thanks guys. It was a lot of fun. Uh, hope I wasn't too long winded. Um, it, it's hard to, to separate a lot of this stuff into a very concise thing because what you see is there's a lot of things that overlay on top of one another. And if you just kind of leave something out there, it might not be very clear about like, well, well, why did that happen? Why did, you know, you know, why did it man have to leave uh, mainland China? Why did, you know, wh why was uh, anybody who trained with him so popular? And what were the, um, the conditions that made, um, that made uh, China turn into what it did? So I, I think there's, you know, um, everybody should like look into things more instead of just saying like, hey, this is my martial art. It's not like nothing exists in a vacuum. Go back and look yeah. at the history. Look back and, and see what you can find out. Like, you know, everybody tends to think about like their teacher as some kind of infallible <clears throat> um, uh, prophet. But the first thing that, that I say to people when they come in, I say, I want you to assume that I'm lying to you. I want you to never take anything that I say as gospel. If I can't prove to you it works, if I can't demonstrate to you how it works, then don't do it. One of the first things I do with people is like when I'm demonstrating a technique, the first thing I do is demonstrate it wrong. So they're like, look, this is what it looks like. You feel that? Yeah, that didn't work. OK, now do it this way. So now, you know, it works. And, and I, I find that's pretty helpful that way, because a lot of times you get people that they just want to they want to believe in somebody. They really like their teacher. They they want to think that he's this great fighter and stuff like that. I'm like. I'm, I'm, I, I can't say that I'm some great fighter. I haven't been in that many fights, you know, especially like all the fights I, the last fight I was in pretty much was maybe 28 years old. You know, you know, I do regular sparring and things like that, but it's, it's very, very different. It's like, and, and this is one of the things that you really have to focus with people. Um, I think one of the keep things realistic, don't be afraid to, uh, I get people coming in here and, and you guys will probably see this too, where you get a guy coming in and maybe he's been picked on most of his life. Maybe he's been, you know, kind of uh, bullied around and things. He's probably never had the opportunity to punch somebody and, and see what it feels like. Um, and I'll put on the headgear and I'll take a few shots to the head so that, well, now somebody says to you, have you ever punched somebody in the face? They'll be like, no. Well, now you have. Now you kind of know what it's like. This is one of the things that the um, uh, those the, the dummies that uh, are shaped like a person and you can punch on them and things like that and you can actually hit them in the face. Yeah, they are very uh, productive. In World War One, when we sent our troops over to Europe, um, we put them through basic training with a standard bullseye target. And no matter how good the marksmen were, when they got over to combat and they had an actual human being coming at them, they would freeze. We changed that into just a silhouette. So when they went into combat, that next wave of troops, the numbers completely reversed themselves. So now 80 percent of the troops were able to shoot another human being because in their mind, they had already done it because they weren't just shooting at the bullseye target. They were shooting at something that looked like a human being. So when you have somebody and and conversely, too, <clears throat> you have to let people know what it feels like to take a punch. And I'm not saying like you wop on them and things like that, but like, you know, you'll see this an awful lot. People get hit for the very first time and they freeze. So you, and it's our job as, as a teacher to kind of prepare people for these things to say like, look, these things can happen. You can get thrown down to the ground. Can you get back up quickly? You could, you know, fall down. Do you know how to stop yourself so you don't land on your wrist and break your arm? And those are those are very, very important elements that you have to keep things very realistic with. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, Andy, I really love your comprehensive approach to, uh, you know, be talking about like martial arts in general. And, and I think your passion for history and everything like that shows when when you talk about that. Yeah, uh, I would be nice if um, there wasn't so much bias disinformation out there. Um, because again, like you, you have people out there that want to show that, well, it's not my style. So I have to make sure that style looks like it stinks. 
Uh, and I have, you know, at some point I plan on doing a video series about this, how like, you know, the Dallas movement influenced the Korean martial arts and the Korean uh, in, in the 600s. Uh, um, the emperor sent Dallas missionaries to Korea and it, they embraced it so much that they put the yin and yang symbol on their flag. So they recognize it as part of their national identity. And this goes all the way back to the Joseon period at about like uh, 1500 and not just like the modern times in South Korea. So there, there's a connection there as well with the Dallas ideas. And so, and you can find that if you look at the, uh, at Taekyeon, the original, the precursor to modern Taekwondo and Tang Soo you'll see a lot of those elements inside there. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for, for coming and speaking with us today. Thanks guys. It's, uh, it's been fun. Yeah. Andy Masterson, Masterson's Kung Fu, uh, com in New Jersey. Um, yeah, it's been great talking with you. Likewise. Thanks guys. Thanks Andy. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Wing Chun Discussion Podcast. Log on to wingchundiscussion.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. More episodes are available on iTunes, Google Podcasts, and Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.